Namaste. I am Yogendra Deva, your host for this third edition of the Open Houses. On behalf of the Dr. Bhavan Academy of Geologists, I welcome you all to this program. For a mid-June afternoon, it is indeed a very pleasant weather today here in Delhi and Seattle. I wanted to thank the pre-monsoon shower last night for this, but I'm sure your presence here is actually making the weather so cool. So thank you for that. I'm sure you all are enjoying the same at your places. As for the open houses, many of you are now quite familiar with the format of this program, but a quick heads up should be in order. Well, the Academy is giving new dimensions to consulting and to the mentoring and training of young professionals. The open houses are our way of keeping in touch with you all over a brainstorming session. This program is on our regular agenda and rest assured we shall keep returning with it frequently. The topics for this open houses are suggested by you and you have already given us enough topics to keep the open houses going, if I may say so, for decades. Well, jokes apart, we have a good number of topics with us and more of these keep pouring in every time you register. Keep doing that. Keep giving topics. We love it. So today's topic of common interest is assessment and treatment of dam foundations. And the initiator is none other than Sri Balraj Joshi, a construction and design engineer par excellence. And uh, before I hand over the session to Dr. Gopal Dhawan, founder and chairman of the Academy, for a better brief on his friend and colleague, Shri Joshi, let me remind you that uh, you can raise queries on the chat box anytime you wish during the presentation. We shall be discussing these after the presentation. Uh, so now it's over to you, Dr. Dhawan. The ball is in your court, sir. Sir, we are waiting. That's bad. Well, I start again. Good afternoon, friends. I am Dr. Gopal Dhawan, your co-host for this program today. I am delighted to see many senior uh, professionals, many friends and known faces. We are really obliged that all of you are taking so much interest in programs uh, of Academy. Today, our speaker is Shri Balraj Joshi. Shri Joshi has risen to the ranks of NHPC initially as a construction engineer and later as a designer of several hydropower projects in India, Bhutan and Myanmar. As Director Technical and CMD, he had made significant contributions for progress of NHPC and hydropower sector in India. He had immense contribution for construction and commissioning of Kishanganga project, wherein he represented NHPC in World Bank and also participated in the proceedings of International Court of Arbitration between India and Pakistan at Hague, Netherlands. His another achievement was um, 2000 megawatts Suvansri Hydro project of NHPC in Arunachal Pradesh which was started since December 2011. It could be restarted during his tenure as CMD NHPC due to his consistent efforts at technical, legal, social, and political forums. He is also credited with acquisition of Tista 6 project by NHPC through mechanism of NCLT. This is the only case 
of acquiring a private private project uh, by a public utility like in space even after his retirement he is professionally very active as a member of panel of experts uh, ntpc and men, member of dam safety panel government of chatisgarh given his unique experience both in construction and design shri joshi is the best to justify position of initiator or the key speaker on today's topic for this open house session on assessment and treatment of dam foundations over to mr joshi please thank you very much uh, dr dhawan for uh, this uh, i should say an exaggerated uh, uh, introduction of mine i had got opportunity to work for nhpc for about 37 years and whatever came my way i try to do my so i am so thankful to you and before i just start the presentation uh, i would like to thank uh, ddag that's the davans academy of geologists uh even the times of this corona we are social distancing is a norm so i think ddag has a of social distancing by keeping us at our homes but still making us meet in a virtual meeting here uh, am i audible to all yes you are yeah so i'm so thankful to you for giving us this opportunity to talk about the topic being very general and uh, i would uh, request your perseverance on this there are certain photographs which i will try to jump in jump and uh, uh, run through faster uh, so that we can make up the time so with those words i would uh, now like to start the presentations why uh, because of the fact that the power just now has gone in faridabad and i am working on uh, uh, through the telephone it's normal not the normal wifi so please bear with me I will see the presentation now. Are you able to see the presentation? No, no, Joshi, not yet. Well, I have. Uh, Your screen is not yet shared. Uploaded it. It's shared now. Is it visible now? No. Yes, now it is. Now okay. it is done. So all set. All, all set, and we start here. Way. So I have been already introduced, and the topic is also very well known to you. And uh, before I present, let me say what I'm going to cover. What are the what are the topics which are going to be covered in this? There are. thousands of dams constructed worldwide so we will just have a look at the dams we will also have a look at the mechanics of loading including seismic loading on the dams what kind of investigations are there? and then what kind of parameters would be taken for these investigations which we use for design and that which are in vogue which have been in vogue earlier and this is for example in the academy topics the shastra formula need for enforcement uh, necessity of the re relevance of stripping the water tightness of the reservoir And uh, what is not covered is that any any of such because that will be becoming too big or big to be covered in a minute or thirty five minutes. Uh, uh, I am thankful that uh, Dr. Dhawan has given me more than thirty minutes this time, considering the size of my presentation. So they are not going to cover any considerations and the detailing of the investigation. For example, 
which have been given also at the end of the presentation. Uh, can you do something? And uh, as becomes clear, uh, the viewers are requested to look at pointing out that your voice is cracking. Maybe because of Wi-Fi. Can you do something? I can bring my laptop closer to me. Is it okay now? It's better. It's better. Uh, Okay, so I will just again start that what is not covered are the engineering considerations pertaining to layout of ancillary works because that will make it the topic very big and the detailing of the required investigations for which enough codes and references are available and similarly details and testing as well as construction methodologies. We are not going to cover the details, which are just going to make the mention of this. So is it the voice? Is the voice now clear? Yes, your voice is now better. Okay. It's getting snapped. Now, uh, we can see, see the slide of the dam. Dams are all progressive all over the world. What you're seeing on the left side is basically uh, uh, the photograph from the Lisa, we have been up for dams. And the Tista we are seeing on the left side is Tista 5. In the center, you are seeing those, the, the map which is showing the number of plots is basically a plan of the Shizaki project in Myanmar. Talking about the NRRD, which is the, uh, the National Register for Large Camps, we, we have uh, uh, Five thousand two hundred sixty-four subject in the items and four thirty-seven dollars and dollars. And if you see the time, we can see that from seventy to nineteen ninety. In those days, more than five hundred dams have been constructed in India. And as far as the world scenario is concerned, eight thousand. These figures are dynamic in the So uh, viewers are requested to check those figures with the current status. And uh, if you see the dam, which is out of these, thirty-five percent are the concrete dam. Whereas the two dams are about. Joshi, please move your slides also. Uh, I, you, yeah, yeah. Please move your slides. No, I am moving my slides. that. On the slide, it is the slide yes. number one. Yes. Are you seeing that the dam types now? No, so not yet. Seeing what. Which slide are you seeing? Uh, number one slide. We are still number one slide with, with your with your name. The title slide. It is not yet moved. Sir, it is showing only the title slide. There is no change of slide. Yes. Uh, It is not clear. Your voice is not clear. Please. Uh, I think uh, we... uh, voice is cracking. Please look into that. Uh, Telephone is ringing. Mike, sabhi log apna mute rakhiye. Ah, Mike, abhi dekhe sir. Ah, nahi, abhi nahi hui. Acha, apko abhi show mode pe nahi aayi hai. Apki jo the uh, presentation is ये स्लाइड शो के मोड में आनी चाहिए स्लाइड शो के मोड में अभी नहीं है स्लाइड शो में ही है 
आपकी तरफ से तो बंद करना पड़ेगा मैं तो उसको स्लाइड शो कर चुका हूँ बिकॉज इट इट इज गिविंग मी इंडिकेशन जिसे स्टॉप शेयरिंग आई से नो इज शेयरिंग सो मे बी फ्रॉम योर साइड एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर साइड समथिंग हैज टू बी डन i think uh, almost everybody is uh, writing in the chat box uh, similar comments anirudh kya are you listening anirudh is it coming now anirudh if you are listening please yeah now the slide has changed Okay. now you are at the layout of presentation okay but your full screen is not visible now it's, uh, it's visible now is it okay now uh we are at layout of presentation yes that's right so i uh, i will again yeah now it is okay. okay now it is okay now it is full screen right Fine. Fine. Now it is in uh, slide show mode. Right. Good. Good. Wonderful. Now it's okay. Please, please continue. So I'll continue now, and we are seeing these dams. They are all pervasive. There, some of them are for irrigation, some are for hydropower, and some are even for recreation and fishing, fishing activities. But they are all over the world. Fifty-eight thousand large dams, thousand two hundred sixty-four dams in India. and 437 are still under construction and as we see from 1971 to 1990 there there have been 2500 dams constructed in india uh talking of dam types the concrete dams uh, form 35% of the total dams and the fill dams are 65% and if you see the other uh, details like uh, concrete dam covers gravity dams arch dam buttress dam and multi multi arch dams whereas fill dams means rock fill dams earth dams concrete fill rock fill dams etc now as for i called bulletin 99 out of 170 failures if you see the failures the concrete dams are less than 15% and out of them also gravity dams are only 11.35% arch dams are 1.17% buttress dams 2.48% and so on uh, remaining are earth fill and rock fill dams but the important point to be seen here is there's a slight shift of the block uh, this reason for failures the foundation failure is 60% which is very high from overtopping is only 25% and there are other reasons of 15% so we note that the foundation failures have caused 60% dams to fail failures are scary because as you can see when the water is let out in an uncontrolled fashion the havoc which it can create apart from the loss to the facility itself and in the center you are seeing the picture of the recent failure of michigan dam in usa now uh, this means that uh, still there are certain aspects of the dam se sector as a whole which are probably not very clear to the scientists and despite the fact that 58000 dams have been constructed still we are going we are having presentations and seminars where we are discussing the necessity of assessment and suitable treatment measures now let's see what uh, what is our target when we want to construct a dam at a, any location we want a sound foundation and that should be available at a reasonable depth and uh, we have an example of uh, puna sanchu 1 where the reasonable depth uh, the depth has exceeded our reasonability limits and this uh, has a tendency to create instability in the abutments then we need an almost leak proof reservoir of the required capacity required capacity is also important and then allowing the passage of spillway that means there are certain dams where even though the dam access per se has been investigated and nicely selected but no consideration seems to have been given as to what is going to happen when the spillway is going to function on the downstream side thereby resulting in lot of damage to various projects uh one of the major uh, considerations when we go for selecting a dam site is that it, the valley must be very narrow but let me put up a point here that the narrow valley also needs to have a spillway and if the spillway is a bigger one considering the river catchment area and the flood discharges the very narrow narrow valley will require to be excavated and that will create a greater instability onto the abutments and sides so it will not be a good choice and i think it is time that we started saying no to those sites where we find that just for the sake of uh, fitting a spillway because of the narrow valley 
and the, the instability is going to uh, be caused into the into the apartments. Those those uh, sites, I think, should be outrightly uh, rejected. And also one must consider the fact that with the passage of time and the facts like climate change, our flood values are increasing and increasing. So this factor has to be kept in mind while selecting a site. Then there are other engineering considerations like uh, it should afford a diversion system properly. This must have a very good quality aggregate around and it should have a reasonable uh, facility area. Now, these are the sites, photographs of the sites, which uh, need extra care. In the left side of the pane, you are seeing the Puno Sancho Dam, and uh, the right top is the spoil dam of NTPC, where a lot of damage has occurred to the right side and the left side of the spillway. Uh, similarly, if you see the right bottom corner of the presentation, we have a fossil valley. This is a picture from Parvati project. We will be detailing this Parvati treatment further ahead in the presentation. But these are the possible situations where more care needs to be given. Now, let me just go through what kind of loads are acting on the dam. Of course, these are very, very uh, prim uh, preliminary kind of information. But uh, just to set the tone of the presentation in a manner that we must know what kind of load and what extent of loads are acting on this huge wall of uh, which we call a dam. And my presentation certainly would be dealing more with the with the concrete dam, considering the fact that even for urban dams also we require uh, spillways anyway, and the concrete dam it becomes a necessity. So dead load, reservoir and tailwater loads, uplift pressure, earthquake forces, earth and silt pressure, ice pressure, wind pressure, wave pressure, thermal loads, and the latest one added is nappy forces. When the spillway operates, it also creates a, some kind of force onto the dam. There's a very beautiful code called 6512, which has been issued by BIES, which uh, talks about the design of solid gravity dams. And if uh, we see the requirement for stability, uh, kindly mark the red color in here. The dam shall be safe against sliding on any plane or combination of planes within the dam and also at the foundation or within the foundation. The next requirement is the dam shall be safe against overturning at any plane within the dam at the base or at any plane below the base. The safe unit stresses in the concrete or masonry of the dam or in the foundation material shall not be exceeded. So the crux of this slide is that it's not the, the code is not meant only for the design, but it's basically considering the behavior of the foundation under various loads, which we have seen just now. So foundation remains the key. Now, the, since the geological information is to be provided by the geologist and the designer has to take that, read that, those values and use it in the design. So a geologist must provide the entire information on the above factors to the designer and a designer must understand the limitation of the geologist and provide for additional treatment and safety measures accordingly. He should not go on harping that, no, I want this particular value as uh, it's a must for my design. Uh, therefore, and the geologists say that it's not possible for him to give that, that value because probably the machine cannot be taken to such a location and things like that. So, but these, both of these people, they have to work hand in hand and then a synergy can result, which will result in ultimately safer dams. So the main concerns after the site selection, if we sum up, um, the stability of the dam and foundation is the main concern. Water tightness of the foundation and reservoir is a concern and also the acceptable settlement, which is actually more relevant for the fill dams, but for the concrete dams also, settlement is certainly not desirable. So these are the three main considerations on which our investigations have to hover around. Now talking of the stability, I'm not going to the detailing of this. Uh, uh, I think most of us actually know this. If you see the left figure, there's safety against overturning, uh, we say that if uh, my resultant force is acting in the middle third, that's B by three in the center, then I will ensure that my dam is not going to overturn. Generally, a designer does not take into consideration the foliation of the planes or the shear zone or the weaker zone passing under the dam for this overturning calculation. And considering the dam as a rigid body, he applies all those loads and cal calculates a factor of safety which uh, also corresponds to the limits given in the 6512, but probably it's time that he should also start looking at those planes where a possible starting in the foundation can occur. 
and this is a very uh, good formula written here for well, working out the factor of stability against sliding. The two red arrows are showing you that the two main components of this formula are tangent phi and c. So phi and c are important for working out the factor of safety. So they must be very, very accurately investigated and tested. Talking of stress distribution, the designer has been so far using a gravity method of base pressure distribution. Uh, I am saying so far because uh, not many dams have been constructed after those uh, those, those uh, decades which we have seen. FEM was a later addition, but FEM has told us that probably the load diagram which we assume in the dams, it is not so. And the lower one where the base cracked indicated word is written here, we can see that load diagram basically is like this. And the maximum load is not acting at the toe of the dam, but slightly towards inside of the dam. Now this changes slightly our perception of the dam, of the dam foundation because the forces are not spread over the entire base. That's one thing. And the maximum stress is not exactly occurring at the toe, but slightly before the toe. Now let us see the next part. Uh, rocking motion during the earthquake and these two figures which you see. The general notion is that foundation is basically equally loaded is wrong because in the seismic conditions, the dam tends to rock back and forth depending upon the direction of the excitation given to it and actual measurements taken on certain dams have actually corresponded they have shown consonance with the FPM models done for those model, for dams. And we find that such a scenario where this rocking motion is actually happening is not only a picture drawn on the paper, but it actually happens at site. So we must provide for this. And here also in the bottom, you can see where the dam is moving backwards. That means the excitation towards the right side, the green line that tends to become slightly lesser loaded than the red line. So the total load of the dam, as we understood, is now basically being given to the foundation of a, of a reduced uh, dimension. And therefore, the factor of safety which we use for the rock uh, compressive stent and other, uh, other uh, parameters, they are not uh, very, very conservative. Next part uh, of importance is the seepage underneath. As we said that this space must be a watertight reservoir. The abutments must be watertight, so water loss doesn't occur. In the foundation, uh, this is more of uh, the figure shown is for the fill dams, but I will again come back again in the presentation that even the rocks also, they carry uh, seepage uh, and piping can occur in rocks also. So hydro flashing of the joints and shears in the rocky foundations is another uh, problem which can happen. And uh, therefore, the, it's obligatory on our part to provide treatment to the foundation by means of the cutoff walls. On the right side, you can see the section, which is basically a uh, section taken from Dhauliganga Dam. And uh, Dhauliganga Dam was a dam where uh, the overburden was about 70 meters. And there was no way in those times that this excavation could be made and a concrete dam could be erected there. So what we decided was to create, uh, place in CFRD here with a very deep cutoff wall, which is about 70 meters, going one meter into the rock. Now, after having seen those loads and what kind of uh, considerations are there, let's go to foundation assessment. This is a picture uh, from Tista 5 project after the diversion was made and after that entire excavation for the dam foundation was made. As you can see, the dam, puffer dam is also around uh, 50 meter high and uh, not much water seepage was seen. So that means we have to define the foundation first, including abutments. And I have just jotted down a list which shows you in red color the surface investigations, subsurface investigations, earthquake studies, soil and rock testing, and in special studies. The list is uh, slightly exhaustive but not complete as more and more uh, test methodologies are coming uh, out of the research. Uh, but still, I can say that as much information about the foundation as you can give easily given within your time and cost that must be given. And considering all these uh, tools are available to us. Now, what do you get from these para investigations? As far as the foundations are concerned, what we are looking for is depth of the overbird, the theology of foundation and abutments, including paleo channels, joint orientation and continuity, dip strike thickness, composition and extent of force, and predominant shears. 
Now, I must mention here that the extent is very important. It's not enough to interpret the presence through one or two holes. If a geologist feels that the extent of the fault and the shear can be detrimental to the excavation stability or can contribute to the delay in the project, he must not feel shy in asking for more investigations and must emphasize that unless you give me this particular hole or particular investigation done, I will not be able to give you a complete picture. And uh, and he should not be, not be, the designer should not be satisfied simply if the geologist also says that, okay, one hole is given, I'll just draw one section and show a shear zone. Probably that will not be in the trust of designer also. He would like to know the extent of the shear. So it's important that the extent is also given upstream and downstream both ways. Whether in condition of the rock mass, and then physical tests of the foundation, rock parameters, laboratory and institute tests. I understand Dr. Rajbal is also in the audience and about the testing part, laboratory as well as the institute. There's no other uh, better person than to ask questions about how these tests are to be performed in laboratory and also at site. Now, what are the properties we're looking for actually? We're looking for foundation properties, the deformation modulus, compressive strength, tensile strength, shear strength, Characters by C and Phi. Uh, I have already emphasized the necessity of C and Phi for the designer because he uses that for working out a factor of safety, which is basically the bread and butter of uh, a designer. Then Poisson's ratio and the dynamic strength properties. Now about dynamic strength properties, one must say that it's not very easy to find out dynamic strength properties. And some of the latest thinking in the USBR also says that probably dynamic strength properties are important not for the stability, but for the stability and the serviceability after an earthquake has happened. And therefore, being slightly conservative on these properties would certainly help us. Next. Now, after having known that these are the investigations to be carried out, how do we make the beginning? You have a topographical map of the project and layout of the project is superimposed over it. And then we say what information historically is available, whether the regional geological maps are telling me something. Then we plan our investigations and evolve an investigation plan like this, wherein we say we want these, these, these number of holes, and then we need SPT tests in these holes. So we need so many plate load tests. We need so many Goodman Jack tests. We know uh, we know uh, we require so many PLT tests and shear tests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think geologists and designer they must spend time together while evolving an investigation plan because the designer and also possibly the site engineer would tell you the site difficulties. And after this investigation plan is evolved, then finally we can actually right away get going on the site and carry out the necessary investigations in required time and give the all the required parameters to designers. This is another example of a Myanmar project, which was the Manthi project. Very long uh, rock fill dam, 84 meter high. This was about 1200 megawatt project, not yet built, but the DPR was uh, cleared by CEA. And uh, in the lower half of the photograph, you're seeing a section, longitudinal section of the dam, not very visible. That's why I have just Exploded this view here, you can see that this number of drills were drained and all the horizons, all the geological and lithological units were nicely captured by our geologists. And also the strength of these SPT values, they were also superimposed on these uh, depths. It was very, very helpful to the designer that he could actually play with or move around his structures considering the strength of the rock down below. The heterogeneity of the foundation in Himalayas is uh, certainly uh, not to be uh, even mentioned. Everybody knows that it is there and very much there. Right from the days of Bakara, this is a cross section of Bakara Dam. As you can see, number of here, this is available on net. You can have a detailed look. But such a high dam is now situated on such a heterogeneous rock, where is, whereas you have a clay stone in the heel, there's a shear zone on the axis. In the middle, there's clay stone. In the toe, there's a shear zone. The apron is clay stone and the dam itself is resting on the sandstone. Now, if just imagine the factors which we have discussed just now about the loadings, what will happen to the dam in those areas where the strength is lesser or where strength is more? You can make a guess yourself. And I will just again come back to Bhakra once more when we talk about the treatment methods. 
So I have already said this that the foundation was contains different rocks of varying strength. It may be weathered in varying degrees. It may have fossil values, paleo channels, solution cavities, and that's another factor where solution cavity, uh, where where uh, the designer has to and the geologist has to be very very careful. That the state of affairs at Mosul Dam in Iraq is known to us. What happened there because of the caustic uh, cavities underneath, and U.S. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers had to be called there to devise upon the strategies and plan of treatment. The wetland may have very dipping joints accompanied by shears and water, so so much of heterogeneity is to be covered, and therefore the investigation plan must be aligned accordingly. Talking of abutments, we have the history of uh, failure of Malpasse Dam in France. Through two photographs, not very good ones, but this is the best I could get from the net. And uh, as you can see, the lower photograph, they, they say complete wedge has been formed. There was one. Uh, shear zone and also a fault zone they were they were going away from each other but they were unfortunately crossing at the dam abutment only and once the arch dam which is uh, known to act on the on the abutments it started uh, acting on the abutment and the shear load of the water it caused so much of thrust that the entire wedge it it was taken off and the dam broke in no time the right side we have uh, we have some belly excited exfoliation joints and some block shears which must be considered which must be investigated first and then then considered how dangerous are they can we really support them by proper known and feasible methods of rock support or not otherwise we can go for stripping and scaling we'll come to that in a bit moment of time so let's now talk of the treatment measures The rock foundation, if you excavate in a stepping way towards the downstream side, this aids in sliding. It helps the stability of the dam all right. Sometimes it may not be feasible. I think most of the times it's not feasible because we would actually like to start the concreting as early as possible, but still in cases it's possible. And in case the dams are of having that kind of damage potential, it's worthwhile for a designer also to look at the possibility of providing such a stepped foundation to give better stability. IS triple one double five gives you all these sketches that I have taken from there. It shows that you shouldn't have one slope going on under the blocks, and the, the, these are the methodologies where if you have steps like this, the stability is improved. And uh, as you can see, the, some of the blocks can have under the, that's the two B. Uh, figure if you see, then two blocks can be placed simultaneously and the foundation of the and the contraction joint can start from that height. So this detailing is already available on triple one double five. This is another uh, method uh, which can help us in uh, improving the stability of the dam. Now these measures are to be given by designers on the basis of geologist reports. What kind of reports? Hill stabilization during excavation can be done by rock anchors, boards, short heat of all types. I'm not going to go into the details. They are very well known already. The foundation can be improved by consolidation grouting, by curtain grouting, and by drainage pressure relief holes to reduce the uplift pressure on the dam and rock crevices. Similarly, for paleo channels, the clay capping on paleo channels, cutting and filling of the coal trenches, these are the general methods available to us. And uh, these are uh, the methods which don't require any state of art equipment and tools also, and they have been being followed, but probably they will not be enough in some situations. There is a very famous uh, formula called the Shasta formula for the dental treatment. We say that the excavation after the excavation of the dam is done, we must investigate whether any shears, big shears and the shears rising concern are there, and then we must excavate those shears and, uh, and fill them with backfill concrete. Now the question would be how deep we go. So here again, USBR has come to our help and they have devised this formula, famously known as Shasta formula, which says that uh, so, so D is equal to so and so. That means you have to excavate the shear zone or the weak area corresponding to its width and height of the dam given in feet. Mind you, this formula is in feet. So because uh, when you add uh, plus five, so you don't convert just uh, uh, 
the, the height of the dam in, in meters than the, then probably something else will do that. So convert it into feet, which I have done for you. And now in this formula, we say that if the width, the width of the shear zone is three feet and height is 328 feet, which is corresponding to about 100 meters, the depth required is seven feet. That's okay. But when you go further ahead and the B rises to five meters, the depth required is 40 feet. And 40 feet is about good 12 meters. Now, if a shear zone of five feet is to be excavated, can you go 12 meters below? How can you go in the foundation? So this possibly is not applicable to those situations. Therefore, I would say I would request the Shasta, Shasta formula should not be applied blindly because the US Army Corps of Engineers in their manual also say that this formula was basically devised by them only for reasonably homogeneous foundations with very minimal kind of shears. It's not to be applied in such uh, situations like in uh, like we encounter in Himalayas. And next for the vertical or sub-vertical or even sub-horizontal zones, such as excavation may not be feasible. Deep excavation will require the flatter slopes. Uh, there's a famous drawing we, we give for the trench which is to be cut with a side slope which should be stable. And in the process, basically, we damage the rock more. So rather than helping us there in the stability of the dam, we are harming the stability of the dam by excavating so large trenches in the foundation. Because these excavations, even uh, though we put restrictions on blasting, they have to be blasted. And whenever we blast it, and, and we know the, how the blasting is carried out in the field, uh, not many precautions are taken. So it can damage the foundation. So we should be quite aware of the situation also. And if you're not able to excavate, in such a case, the strength characteristic of the shear zone, etc., should be accurately defined, as accurately as possible, as best it can be given. And then the next step will be to carry out a final FEM analysis and uh, try to model that particular weaker feature to see whether it misbehaves under that body condition. Hello. Is it because of this side or their side? Hello. Am I audible now? Yeah, it's okay now. Please continue. Now, depending upon the orientation and thickness of the weak zones and the strength characteristics, even no treatment may be necessary other than the surface treatment, just plainly cleaning the, the, the surface and uh, putting concrete may be good enough. Now, second, uh, the last point which I want to make on this is the lean concrete concept. To my mind, this is not a logical concept because what we are doing is we are removing a, a, a shear zone which is possibly comprising of a weaker material. And we are again filling it with lean concrete and we call it a mud concrete. Sometimes we don't give any care to the mud concrete or whatever comes in our hand, we start putting it. But mind you, at that time also, we are creating a source of weakness into the dam. So I think treatment should be the same grade concrete as the main dam concrete or maybe even better. Now we come to abutment and the foundation stripping. It's best to remove the foundation material if it could cause excessive settlements and leakage, which is again a matter of design. We will not naturally like to have any material which is not going to form the bond with my concrete, so I would like to remove it. If this is not feasible, dam design should be modified to take account of such material by adopting appropriate measures. I have just now referred that in the, in the context of Shasta formula. There have been also a practice which we have been following of stripping the stripping the abutments. I say stripping should not be adopted as a general rule. It has caused more serious instability than the good that was done by it. Instead, if you feel that the rock is loose, we should carry out just the scaling and not define some kind of thickness for the stripping that it must be done. Decision to strip a valley dipping shear zone to large depth due to possible daylighting. This also should be made after a rigorous investigation analysis with the strength properties model and modeled holistically. I will explain that what I mean by this is when we come to this sketch. Now here I have tried to show two shear zones which are valley dipping and shear zone one in my view, uh, the foundation, the dam foundation is where the small man is uh, seen standing. This is not harming us anyway, so why should we excavate this? Now we come into shear zone two, and such situations are generally found in Himalayas. We have some shear zones and we want to excavate that. 
And coupled with that, if there are regional systematic joints, some, some block failures can occur. The designer has to really see to this condition that whether she can stabilize this block by proper rock support or not. And if he, he's able to convince and able to show that this is possible and have reasonable confidence in his factor of safeties, I would say that even for shear zone two condition also, no excavation or no sipping is required. And when this shear zone is, even though it's shown pinching here, even if it goes to the foundation, in the foundation, probably Shasta formula, if it is feasible, can be done, uh, can be adopted, and the shear zone can be slightly chalked out and filled with backfill concrete. Now here, this is the important part, is the trend thickness and extent of shear zone to be conclusively determined by drilling core holes. I have referred to this earlier also, that just drawing one section is not enough. You must extend, extend, uh, uh, have more investigation and extend this, this shear zone and upstream and downstream side to give an indication to the designer that whatever rock support you're proposing is going to cost this project so much. So accordingly, some decisions can be taken. Uh, these are simple uh, foundation treatments which we have been doing earlier, rock cleaning with the brooms and wire brushes to remove the loose material. Use of air water jet for cleaning, we shouldn't damage the rock. We sometimes to hasten the progress, people use a larger compressor and a larger force of the air water jet, which further damages and particularly in the rocks, like weak rocks like shale, dolomite, etc. Then the foundation star keeps coming out and we have good examples where large excavation needed to be carried out just for the foundation preparation. So one has to be reasonably uh, clear in his mind what he is intending to do. The best thing is to keep the foundation covered till the concrete is started. And uh, even some places where the weaker rocks are there and you are fearful that because of the rains, this can get damaged, it will be better to apply short grade, uh, on the surfaces, even on the foundation also, I would say, if there's a large time gap between the concrete placement and excavation. Short hitting the rocky foundation and, and the cutoff trench for earth and rocky dams is already being done, and this must be kept in mind. The last and the fifth uh, protection of the foundation uh, parameters I have jotted down here is role of anchor bars. Mechanically, we start giving some anchor bars here and there, considering that this is going to support my foundation and the dam factor of safety is going to improve. Abutments, in abutments, we might have a case that you know anchor bars certainly can improve my rock parameters. So we, we can, and that's a design support anyway. But just for the heck of it that we are going to provide some anchors is going to give stability. I would say a big no, because if they have a more of a placebo effect that we have to place some iron, so this is good. But probably if you consider the total forces which we have discussed and the sheer strength of the rock of those bars at those levels, these are just placebos. Now we come to treatment measures which are special. Uh, we, what we have discussed so far the general, and these are the special measures now. Cable anchors, micro piles for abutment stabilization. This is uh, also not a very, very new method now, but this must be very well thought of and uh, the analysis, holistical analysis has to be done. The shear slip circles have to be defined and accordingly the tendons have to be designed and they are supposed to work. They actually have been known to work. We should not be shy of using ground imaging measures anymore and we should not place reliance on simple journal support where a special support may be required. Then we come to diaphragm walls, which are curtain walls. I've, uh, I've included small sketches here. They are not very, very big ones, but uh, probably they can be the meaning which I wanted. The di diaphragm wall would mean that you got a trench in the till the uh, rock is uh, uh, encountered and then fill those panels in with the uh, with the kind of concrete. Uh, in Dhaliganga, we had a plastic concrete because it could uh, adjust with the, in the earthquake uh, conditions also. Then we have the jet grouting, which is also another method of ground improvement, whereby we drill holes, large holes, and we load down a tool, churn it very with a, with a high pressure and speed, and mix the grout with the cuttings of the material which is on the walls of the hole. And the bentonite, which is filled in, it keeps on coming out, and a column is established. So in this way, we can have a pattern of the primary and secondary and even tertiary holes. Then water testing is done very, very judiciously. And if required, if we find a certain windows are left, we again go for injection grouting in those places or else we have additional columns drilled. Formation of the TEM grouting, the tube manchet grouting, this is also a very older method, but not very often used and uh, can be used very, very successfully by special, special uh, contractors. 
let me say that doing permission routing by simple means is also not very difficult but the crux of the point of the whole matter is monitoring of the permission routing while it is being done what kind of pressure and what kind of routing material requires to be altered for which you must have a very elaborate instrumentation in the data logging during the construction process that this is the only small uh, a point which i want to make here for the treatment measures that makes it a special treatment measure then we have the geo membranes they are the waterproofing blankets where we find that we have, routing cannot be done waterproofing blankets can be placed but i would say the extent is not very large if you can't uh, think of stabilizing or, or waterproofing an entire uh, uh, abutment in a reservoir for the constructed tanks etc it is okay and i i would say that nice uh, membranes have been devised by by various uh, manufacturers and we have also utilized them in our hydro channels they do work but for reservoirs we have to slightly vary when we are using them because they are uh, tensile and shear strengths may not be matching with the forces which are going to come onto them during the reservoir operation now uh, coming to the permission grouting this is the sketch of this is the section of the parvati project where a fossil valley was encountered i think most of our people know that but uh, how a fossil valley was found in parvati how it was delineated and special drifts were laid out excavated and injection was done as you can see on the right side first stage grouting was done from the top and second stage from the drift and i'm very happy to share with you that after the reservoir has been filled not a single drop of water has come out of the foundation so far this is the curtain which was placed by this formation grouting and very deep formation grouting i would say and this is the photograph during the construction that is how the parvati dam stands now on the left side of the frame you can see that gallery grouting gallery through which the grouting was carried out next example of the foundation treatment is the jet grouting we have done for the first time in tista 5 uh, coffer dam and this was the first time that a dam of such a deep foundation was ever constructed by excavating the uh, foundation to the rock to the, the rbm to the rock level and a number of uh, apprehensions were there what's going to happen when we reach the bottom and these jet grouted columns they have a problem that when they are large they become large the drilling deviation actually causes large windows between two adjacent columns so therefore as a matter of precaution we had also specified injection or permission grouting to supplement and the results are fantastic we have seen the treatment after the treatment the dam pit was almost dry now i had referred in early in my presentation about the diaphragm walls in the rock i had said even the under the hydraulic head the rocks also can tend to give way by peak and occur and this was such an apprehension in the foundation of subansri also because of the slick durability test which were done on the dam they did not uh, they were not very promising and it was apprehended that probably the dam can get the foundation can get uh, solved dissolved in the water dissolved in the water and then can be the piping can occur as it happened in the regular uh, earthen dam on the in the in the flexible foundations so therefore now two cutter walls have been uh, have been provided let me also briefly tell you that this gray area gray kind of a uh, color or a greenish color which you see this was the basically the plant dam and later on after the ddrp came in into the being into the picture the dam design review panel they have uh, reviewed the entire uh, foundation and interaction and also the dam design holistically and they have said that probably we need to extend the spillway away from the foundation in a, so that the water uh, oozing out, water issuing out from the spillway does not harm the foundation and there also the downstream side we have got a cut off wall this has already been constructed now even though this section shows you the under construction uh, the blue color is already constructed and uh, uh, on the right side of the frame the red and the other part also now stands constructed the so complete downstream uh, trench and the upstream trench also they have been joined by two two limbs uh, along the flow direction that's perpendicular to the dam axis so that so as to encase encase the entire foundation within the cutter walls it has been constructed we will see how the dam functions after it is constructed completely right now the construction is going on uh bazaar though your presentation is going on very well but there are number of queries waiting for you 
So I think uh, now I'll, I'll just finish it here, sir. I'll say important treatment measure which have been done. Oh. Uh, left side yeah. is Bakara, Bakara Dam, as you can see from the heel claystone was excavated and the strut was provided here. Now today is the designers probably they will feel very wary of this is such a situation of a strut and they will not provide that probably they will like to enlarge the base of the dam further ahead. But in those times, these, these tools were not available and the strut was given. Uh, how the strut has behaved, uh, it has also been followed up and it has probably created some kind of tension in the galleries and the galleries had to be plugged. Uh, the other section showing you is, uh, is the Sardar's Rover Dam. We are, you can see small, small galleries in the foundation. They were basically the galleries excavated in the red bowl and filled with backfill concrete to increase the sliding resistance of the dam. Okay, this is slightly gone here, here and there because of the use of a different computer. I will just read it for you. The bedrock treatment appropriate to geological conditions is a matter of design but it is not an aspect of design susceptible to numerical analysis. Instead, it requires the exercise of judgment, a sense of proportion. So I would say that we have to keep our ears and eyes open after having known the requirements, after having known the tools at hand, after knowing, uh, knowing what kind of uh, analysis methods are available, we must also keep in mind the judgment and, and exercise of judgment and sense of proportion is certainly the best treatment for these dams. Thank you so much. And these are the references and acknowledgements. You can uh, take it. The copy, I think, will be shared with the, by, by DDAG accordingly. I am so thankful to all of you for having patiently given me this time to present uh, the, the dam assessment of foundation treatment measures. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you very much. It has been a very engrossing presentation, as we expected. And there is a, I mean, a long queue of uh, queries waiting for your replies. Yes. But unfortunately, I think uh, there is no no much time left now. We are almost running out. So I will just share the query list with you. Can you see it? No, uh, yes, yes. So now there are a number of queries. You can see I will just show you from Ajay, then Sabal Ghosh, Vishukarma, Madan Saab, Sabal Ghosh again, Vinay Mishra, Chakravarti, Sindhwani, Sabal Ghosh again, Ajay, A Chakravarti, Sabal Ghosh, A Chakravarti again. A lot of queries. I don't know. I mean, we have got, I think we, we should take at least one query. So uh, uh, I think I will go to, hello, I will go to Mr. Madan. Let me see what he says. You can have a look at it and you can reply this. Yes, sir. So I think I read the question. Are you, are you able to get my voice now? Yeah, yeah. Are you not seeing the list? No, no, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it now. So the question is, what can be the maximum height of a barrage, especially on a weak foundation like fillet and band of bands of carbonaceous fillet? Uh, we have uh, had a good discussion on this issue a number of uh, occasions, and I will tell you that uh, there's no limit as such. And the first question would be, why do you call it a barrage? This has been a very, very uh, all pervasive question. What is the difference between uh, dam and a barrage? I say, I say, what is in the name after all? What we have discussed is what loads are coming and what strengths are available to me. That should govern my design and not the name. So the question by Mr. Mazan is what kind of height of barrage? I would say as high as the rock and the bearing capacity of the rock permits you. You can go ahead with that. When we have the 32.5 meter high barrage at Tista Low Dam uh, 3, uh, which is on a flexible foundation with the RBM material, number of questions were raised and uh, we had instrumented that dam or that barrage or dam, whatever you can call it. The structure is still behaving very nicely. So I would say, if you see, if ask a ball point, ballpark figure, I would say don't go more than 35 meters because 32 meters, I know yeah, we have done it, it, stay, it has stayed. So 35 meters uh, should be a limit uh, in such rocks, depending upon the rock quality and their properties, I would say. Thank you very much, sir. And yes, now sir. there are a number of queries. We don't have time. So what we will do is we will send you the list. You please give the replies on yes. mail. And we will share it with all of our participants. And now right. I think it will be it will be good that uh, Dr. Dhawan thank, thank thanks you for your presentation oh, and the closing uh, remarks. Uh, Dr. Before, Dhawan, please. Before that, I would like to uh, like to uh, pay pay my uh, humble uh, namaste and gratitude to all the people who have come here, especially Dr. Nathani Navani, and also my uh, elder friends, <laughs> Mr. Madhuraj, Mr. Mishra, and uh, 
I can see Mr. Gupta, so many other people. So thank you so much. It has given me really an impact to work nicely. I knew that you are going to come in. And Dr. Rajbal probably could not join. I'm not able to see his name. Uh, but he would be the person I had uh, thought that in the open house, probably he will answer the questions on, on the method of investigation, which had uh, possibly not been raised now. So thank you very much, Dr. Dharavan, and thank you very much, Mr. Deva, for giving me this time. Thank you, Mr. Balraj Joshi. You have done full justice to the topic. And uh, uh, I think it is your experience and hands-on experience in construction as well as design both which makes you capable of, uh, you know, dealing with this complex subject so uh, with such a ease. And certainly I think we have done some injustice to you by not giving you enough time so that you can answer to all questions. And I must tell you that uh, I have gone through all these queries. These are wonderful queries. And rather, I would love to have a session again with you. Uh, and at this time, this time, the session should be guided by the queries itself. Maybe okay. we, may, we may take up one query each at a time and, and then, you know, deliberate on it uh, so that, and, but in that case, I will request all those people who have raised queries to make, make sure that they attend the next session. So we will plan something, but as Mr. Deva said, that we will send you all the queries. You yes. please uh, reply to that. We will share with email and maybe we will try to post it on our website also so that it can have a larger viewership. But it was a wonderful session, although it had some some snags initially, but uh, we overcome it. Oh, and and I think everything went very very well. And my profuse thanks to you, and my thanks to all the senior people, especially Mr. Navani, Mr. Mehrotra, and so many people. Mr. Sab is there. Um, I saw Mr. Das Gupta was there. So really, it is it is um, it, it makes us you know very very responsible that when so many people, so many senior people are giving their blessings to us, we must do better and better in DDAG. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. We are closing this open house now. We are just two minutes late today. But anyways, and uh, we look forward to meeting you again next month sometime. Thank I you would... so much. Thank you for coming. Keep joining us. Yes, sir. Bully, bully. Sir, sir, uh, sir, actually, yes. Hello, sir. Hello, now we are closing the program. If there is any query, you can mail anybody. Any query, they can mail it to us and we will forward it to Dr. Joshi. Thank you very okay, much, sir. sir. Thank you, everybody. Okay. And let okay, us sir. close the program now. Thank you okay. so much. Actually, chat yeah. option is not available for the person. Okay, sir. Thank you.